All right. Welcome back to Ninth Corner of the Octagon with Garrett and Lincoln. Yeah. What is going on, guys? So this past uh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> kill me, kill me. So, um, so this past uh, Saturday, uh, July twenty fifth, we had a pretty pretty nice uh, uh, final fight on Fight Island. Uh, history in the making being made there all around, and uh, might as well just go ahead and jump right into the main event here because I know you and I really wanted to talk about this. Uh, Robert Whitaker versus Darren Till. Really great. Really, really great. I want to talk first. I want to talk about the last like 20, 30 seconds. Okay. That's the first thing I want to talk about. Okay. So Darren hits him with that elbow last second, splits open the side of his head, right? Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. Just absolutely beautiful. And then they had that little stutter second, second where Herb Dean almost stopped it for a sec. Mm -hmm. But if if a doctor had had looked at that, they probably would have stopped it. And I think you think so, really? I, I think so because of how gashed it was. If they would have stopped it, had a doctor come in look at it, they would have blown it out of proportion. It would have yeah. been like the Nate Diaz fight. And do you know how 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 more annoying that would have been than the Nate Diaz one? Oh, way more annoying because it's like we had already had the whole fight. Three seconds left. I'm yeah. so glad. I just wanted to get that out of the way because I was just so glad that they just went, are you okay? Are you okay? And they both went, yeah. And then they yeah. just went back at it, wrestled for the last 30 seconds. I know what you're talking about. That was really, that was weird because. Um... Like, that's what I've been thinking about all day was that last 30, like how that could have been different if a doctor came in or some, or they just didn't do it. Like they didn't have that little hesitation. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting because um, it almost – because I remember I was watching the post-fight interview with Darren Till, and somebody, I think, asked him, like, what was what was it that the ref stopped you guys for in, in the middle of the fight right there? And I don't think it was because uh, – I think it – I don't even think Till knew what it was, like what the reason was. I think he just said, I think the referee thought I got poked in the eye. So – it, it looked like, I guess, from uh, Herb's perspective, that Till had gotten poked in the eye or something like that. Because on, because Herb was on the opposite side of Whitaker where that gash had formed. So I yeah. doubt he even like totally saw the full extent of what was going on right there. Yeah, and, I don't think he did either. And then he kind of he kind of hit it whenever he was wrestling. Yeah. He kind of like pushed it against Till and was like covering it and making sure he couldn't land more shots on it. Yeah. But I think uh, from what my perspective was is Darren kind of pointed at it, mm -hmm. but Herb Dean couldn't see it. But if he did like say like, but I also noticed that they both like if they did kind of get close to poking each other in the eye or like hitting the, each other in the cup. They both were like both the fighters had good communication where they were like, You're yeah. all right, like you still good. Like I saw a few times oh, yeah. they both like asked and they were very professional. High massive, fives after massive every respect, round. yeah, between these guys. These guys were like super respectful, super nice towards each other, very cordial the entire time. You could just tell there was no bad blood between them. I mean, they really I mean, going into this, they really respected each other's tools and what they had going into it. And even after the fight, you know, they were they were saying that that was probably the most mentally stressful fight either of them had been in because the other guy was just so technically proficient. Um, and that was just really nice to see. That was really refreshing. You know, I mean, it happens. It happens a good amount of time. But we, really, it's just it's nice when you get to a main event and there's just absolutely nothing but nice things to say about the other person. I mean, the, the way. Last... Go ahead. The, the last time I felt the same way where I was just like, both of them have been super respectful was like the Anthony Pettis and Cowboy fight. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that one was like, that they were one, thrown out. they were thrown out, but you could just tell that there was like some kind of, there was a tiny tad of animosity right there at some point, just because there was a very blatant eye poke that wasn't called. Um, and even and even Cowboy, you know, not even really yelling at the ref, but more kind of yelling at Pettis, 
for not even calling his own shot. I mean, we knew after the fact that Pettis was 100% convinced he didn't poke him in the eye until we watched the replay, and then it was undeniable. And even um, then, he was, like, joking, like, nah, didn't yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah, that was just – it was goofy. But this was – this this we had this past weekend was really nice. Um, speaking of how technically proficient they were, um, this was definitely – a chess match you know these guys were definitely playing Fair, yeah. uh checkers with each other you know every time somebody uh it, it seemed like every time somebody uh hit the other guy uh they would trade right back with a strike of their own there was a lot of great head movement a lot of good um ducking out of the way there was just a ton of those like matrix moments you know like, i was about to say that every every head kick was a matrix yeah yeah I mean, that kind of reminds me of uh, last week's uh, Marcus Takasi versus uh, – Yeah. I forget his name. I have it pulled up on my screen, actually, so I don't forget his name. It was uh, Rafael Faziv. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of moments like that in that fight. But here, it was shared amongst yeah. uh, the two combatants. Both ways. Yeah. It was like they were throwing a tennis ball back and forth. Yeah, it was insane. Um, I just couldn't believe it. And then on top of that, we had uh, <clears throat> uh, we had uh, we had a, good, a few scares. You know, there was plenty of moments where uh, Whitaker was knocked down and, uh, and Till was knocked down. Um, now it's interesting because when it comes to I want to I want to talk about this round by round uh, because I think this is definitely this was a very interesting fight uh, all the way up. Uh, a lot of people had this fight scored even going into the fifth. So I think breaking it down on a round by round basis, I think is what's really going to be able to help us truly uh, talk about just what the strengths of both fighters were. And I think when it comes to round one, right out of the gate, you know, Till had to try and feel out uh, Whitaker and Whitaker, obviously, right from the get-go, was able to uh, neutralize any kind of advancement just with a few short jabs to the face, give give Till that kind of awareness of Whitaker's power and Whitaker's uh, ability right off right off the bat. Because there's one thing to sit there in interviews beforehand. You know, you watch the tapes, you you talk about it to people, and you say, "Yes, I understand what he's got for me." And then you actually get in there and you actually experience it. So I thought that it was really interesting that Till kind I mean, like, I'm not going to say he strategically got punched in the face, <laughs> but, but, but to an extent, there's some kind of truth to that, you know, being able to yeah. get smacked Butters. up like that. Yeah, it's exactly whenever people always say, oh, now he's got his attention or now he's got his respect. Uh, yeah. I think that was just right from the get go. I, I, Darren Till knew, okay, I know, I know what not to do. And that is not and, run right forward into this guy. And that's the same kind of thing that Robert learned himself in the first round is he mm -hmm. was, he was blocking all of the advancements and then he saw, Oh, well this is easy. So I'll go right in. Yeah. Caught an elbow, got knocked down and then went, Oh, I get it. It's going to be chess, not checkers. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, that was interesting. Cause you could definitely tell um, Robert Whitaker was definitely going in for those big power shots you know right from yeah. right from the gate and a lot of that had to do with uh ducking his head down a lot really leading with his head a lot and just kind of swooping in with these these big power shots and like you just said uh he he stormed in at some point in the, in the first uh maybe a little bit towards the end of the first and uh he got uh he got caught with an elbow now from the perspective that i was looking at initially it looked like yes he got caught with the elbow but because he was throwing his whole body into darren till darren till just kind of like stood his ground and more or less stopped any forward momentum with that elbow and his entire body and 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 kind of created a balance issue for whitaker and it kind of yeah it hit obviously it knocked him down but i think uh, i think it was more like 50 50 like he got caught in the face with that elbow and then it was like he, he his body had no his had no way to uh, correct itself, and it and yeah. you know, Darren's legs were all up in Whitaker's legs, and he just kind of like fell down. He kind of went backwards. Yeah. He definitely um, got he got caught in the momentum of it. Yeah, for sure, and and just 
it was like there was no occupying space in front of him for his body to go and so it just was like well shit i'm going down um and i think that that was actually that knocked down i feel like when it comes to i mean they were both very very uh good in their striking i think that they both did a good job of feeling each other out when it when it came to uh that first round but i can totally see uh why people gave till that first round just because of that knockdown uh he scored yeah. um so going into the it's second the, go it's ahead the edge they they're when they're vote uh when the whole rest of the round is very even it's that one little moment that it takes to push mm-hmm. for sure and going into the second the same thing happens. But this time it's Whitaker who gets the knockdown. Um, and it's actually Whitaker who I think capitalized more on said knockdown uh, because so. he he clocks uh, Till. I think he hit him over the temple uh, with a, one of those big power shots, uh, knocked him down, and then he was able to get on top of him. And for about two minutes was able to uh, control him on the ground and uh, rain down some elbows. Ooh, heavy elbows, just gnarly, gnarly elbows. Um, so yeah, he was definitely, he, he, he definitely dominated in the second round. Um, and then they got back up to their feet and then it was more of a you know, chess match again at that point. Uh, and then going into the third, I think if I'm not mistaken, this was where Whitaker actually picked up a takedown. Yes. Yeah. This was the first takedown he had picked up. Uh, he had tried, I think a little bit. Because cause it kind of gets to that point where you realize, wow, we're really even in our striking. I need to be able to mix it up. And so that's what yeah. Whitaker you know, started to do. He started to mix it up. And a lot of that comes down to um, Whitaker's kind of the bigger guy, you know, mus- muscular-wise. Um, he's definitely got a little bit of wrestling background. And I always kind of knew in, in my video where I was talking about my predictions for how this fight was going to go, one of the things that I had said that I think even Whitaker himself was aware of that when it comes to Darren Till, Darren Till is a great striker. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say he's only got a left hand, um, but as many people would say, as many people would would say. But I do think that Whitaker of the two has uh, the most tools. He has the most things to win a fight with, and been around longer. And been around longer, former champion, uh, uh, the better. He's a bigger veteran. Uh, he's definitely been in some wars with some absolute lunatics, and 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 to Darren Till's credit, you know, to go as far as he did with the former champ, it was actually very impressive. Um, but I think when it comes to that one takedown, and then the fact that the round was more or less just that, just kind of the same old, same old. Uh, you have no choice but to give that to Whitaker, I feel like, um, because it kind of comes down to uh, what the control. You know, I think I think that's yeah. what it always comes down to with fights like these. This is like what happened with Volkanovski and Max. It just come kind of kind of comes down to who controls you the most. You know, if you can pick up somebody's body and put them down, then it and keep them there. And you know, like in round two, just rain down elbows. You're the one that's controlling just- that fight. And just way outdo him in strikes for the whole second round. And oh my just God. put himself way, way ahead on the scorecards for just that one just that one knockdown led it led it to the takedown or to the control on the mat and led to the elbows and led to the accumulation. And then that damage is done and his face is all busted up afterwards. So it really pushed him ahead. Like after that moment, I was like, Darren's gonna have to really work for it to like match it up again. Yeah, I mean, it, it was literally like some 40 strikes to like 13 or something uh, yeah. in round two. Um, I'm actually trying I to... He, I, think he, I think he had the most strikes in every round, even with that knockdown in the first that he had on him. Oh, yeah, he led, he led in strikes the entire time. Let me just pull this up real quick. Yeah, so let me see here. Total strikes, 100 to like 50. Uh, significant strikes, 69 to 41. Uh, they only counted two takedowns, even though in those last like 30 seconds, it looked like he got like an extra like two. Yeah, but they, uh, might, they might be going 
with more wrestling rules. Yeah. Like the one takedown is one takedown, even if you put them down twice. Oh, wow. And as you can see right here, they didn't even count Darren Till's knockdown in round one. They definitely should have. That's, that's, that's and, silly. But that comes from what I said. That comes from how he – it how it kind of just – it more looked like, more like it was a balance problem than anything else. Yeah. It looked like a, more like a slip. Yeah, for sure. Like he just – like he more got knocked off of his feet as opposed to being knocked down from the strike. Um, looking at some of these, let me look at the stats per round. We've got – Oh, I don't want to see all this. That's not that's not accurate. Stuck it. Strikes by position. Stats per round. Anyway. Eh. Anyway. The point is, as you can see, Darren Till obviously, or Robert Whitaker obviously kind of came out the uh stronger fighter uh in this fight. Um but anyway, what I think that what I think is uh the biggest takeaway from that is just um, those leg kicks. I think that was the big, uh, I think that was a big proprietor uh, going into this fight uh, for Robert Whitaker was just the uh, volume of leg kicks. And he's a, he's a good leg kicker. Um, and we know, uh, you know, Darren Till, obviously he's, he's more the boxer kind of guy. Uh, he'll come at you, he'll piece you up, but his kicks just aren't, at least just weren't there in this fight, you know, as they may have needed to be. And even from leaving the first round, it was pretty apparent that his, uh, his right calf was already starting to red up. Um, yeah. But going into the fourth. Never, never switched his stance. Never, never switched his stance. I guess because, you know, he knew that he had a cannon for a left hand. He didn't want to, he didn't want to risk getting rid of his, his biggest tool. Um, but going into Sometimes the. I think outside the box. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what he what he could have really done differently. Um, one of the things that I actually I kept recommending was he ne what he needed to do was because of the fact that Whitaker was constantly you know ducking that head and leading with his head a lot as he's coming in with these strikes. What he needed to do uh, till was either come up with that uppercut or come in with a knee to punish that overextension. Yeah. He did get him with an uppercut once or twice. I, he, he did catch him. Adjust. He did adjust, and he did catch him. I think this was in the fourth. I think he 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 ended up doing the something like this in the fourth. And he pieced him up a few times in the fourth and fifth. Yeah, I think he I think he stunned him a little bit. I think he might have wobbled him in the fourth. I can't remember, um, but I do remember after the fourth was done, because because the fourth was definitely the most quiet of the rounds but i remember it the most because i remember it more than others the most because of those quiet moments accompanied by the the few explosion explosive moments where till was able to you know like you said make that adjustment uh pop whitaker with that uppercut and then was able to wobble whitaker i think a little bit and there was actually a good moment i i remember saying uh to my girlfriend my fiance, that if if he had if Whitaker had been just tagged maybe one more time, he would have gone down. That would have been a, a clean knockdown, uh, knockout. I don't know, but there definitely would somebody definitely would have hit the canvas as opposed to wobbling a little bit and kind of stumbling against the cage. Um, but his legs would have been gone had he been tagged again. Um, and that's just that's how close uh, Till was in the fourth round to securing something akin to uh, a finish and that's why when the fourth was done i and a lot of other people were kind of considering did darren till just win that round you know a lot of people were first of all i have to make a side comment i i'm, I'm not i'm not as big of a fan as i thought i would be of the constant twitter uh some of them stuff popping up some of them are fine, but I actually noticed like when Darren Till got knocked down in the second, I missed what the initial strike was because I literally looked down for a second <laughs> to read what the fucking thing was. It pissed me off because it's like, 
do we ha- I, I'm fine with doing that between rounds. Do we have to do it during the fight? Did you see what Izzy said? I'm I'm, po- I'm I'm typing this, tweeting this just to get it on TV or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, there's someone that gets it. Yeah. This, he's, this, he's doing it right. This is dumb. James Vick posted like he matters after he got knocked out twice. <laughs> but yeah, that was just a aside because I mean I'm not I don't know I'm not I'm not as sure as I'm as big a fan of it as I as I used to be but. Anyway, it's interesting. It's something. It can be. It is interesting. It is nice to hear uh, what other people are thinking live as it's happening, but it can be a little distracting uh, at the wrong times. And that's not necessarily anybody's fault. That also just kind of comes with. All right, I should just ignore this and just watch the fight. But then it's like, why are they posting it? Why are they putting it on the on the same screen as the fights? You know. Anyway, that's not. The it's point. just a thing. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, uh, going into the fifth, uh, this was this was definitely the round uh, Darren Till needed to try and get the finish in order to win, and it just didn't. It wasn't really happening. You could tell he was still making the adjustments. His first of all, I, I haven't said this yet, but Darren Till's takedown defense is stellar. It is spot on. Yeah, he um, doesn't want to go there. Yeah, I knew that that was one of his. I knew that. Yes, he's got that great left hand. He's got great striking all around, in my opinion. But I know for a fact that his takedown defense was also going to be one of his biggest tools going into this. It was going to be one of the the biggest things that he was going to need if he was going to be able to counter anything Robert Whitaker had. Robert Whitaker had a nice counter to the counter where he would start to take him down, and then if he couldn't finish the takedown, come up with that upper hand or that elbow. Yeah, that was pretty tight. That was pretty nice. I thought Robert Whitaker fought a lot like John Jones this fight. Oh yeah, where he was he was spearing the leg, keeping that lead leg down, and any time that he came in, he popped him for his troubles. Yeah, yeah. Like it was the same kind of thing where John does, where he's like, "There's there's this wall between us. Yeah. You come past that wall, I'm gonna hit you." Yeah. He's a very creative uh, striker, Whitaker. You know, he really comes at you from all angles. Uh, yeah. these, these kicks these Very punches I, I like it a lot uh, it, it, it makes it really hard to predict what he's going to do and where he's going to be coming from you know is he is he ducking is he ducking down because he's trying to um, you know go for that takedown is he ducking down because he's trying to come in with another one of those big power shots he makes it he or, he do just, an yeah he just makes it really uh, difficult um one of the things i actually did want to talk about uh in in round four i think one of the reasons i gave it to till before i continue with round five was that uh till was actually also making the adjustments uh i was talking about the stance just now uh darren till was actually getting to a point where he was adjusting his own stance crouching down really low to actually stuff those takedowns more and it was also helping him uh you know duck under these uh head kicks i just thought you know it was, it was really nice he was really he was really it, like it, like i said it was back and forth you know this guy's doing this thing i gotta start doing this thing he's doing this i gotta start doing this i thought that that was really nice and it kept a kept a, a, a very good pace throughout the whole fight excuse me very much there was yeah. one thing i was thinking about whenever darren started crouching down more and being more centered I was like, why doesn't Robert just throw a like a straight kick right up the middle? Yeah, yeah. Catch like do the Anderson Silva. Yeah. Uh, At the time I was thinking like if he just did a front kick right up the middle whenever he's crouching down doing that, he's gonna catch him. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was, I was just waiting for that. Just a little thought. Yeah, yeah. I, I it would have been nice to see. Um, Definitely would have uh, catered to the uh, creativity we were just talking about. Uh, but it kind of makes you wonder, you know, because Darren Till's head movement was on point all night. Uh, of course. Who knows? I mean, that definitely could have caught him right in the chest, too. Um, yeah. any, any kind of shot to the midsection. Would, I mean, he was just he, – he, at the end of the night, Darren Till was just red, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he was just red all over. Uh, he looked but, like he likes Manchester. Yeah. Well, of course, so is Whitaker. You know, his yeah, vein bleeding out all over the place. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was nice going in. But when it comes to round five, obviously the biggest thing to talk about is just uh, the takedown. He got uh, Whitaker gets on Till, 
uh, pretty much towards the end, like within the last two minutes, last minute. Um, and then within that last 60 seconds, it just kind of was, oh, you're, you're trying to build yourself back up. You're going to get back up. Let me just put you right back down. And it's kind All of right. because you know for a fact that there have been fights where we've seen similar stuff like that happen. And they've counted as soon as they stand back up and you knock them back down as another takedown. Yeah, so sometimes it's weird, and then it also depends on where you are. There's yeah. all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, it was interesting. I guess because for a, for a, a, for a good amount of it, Whitaker had had continued to have his hands locked behind Whitaker, so it's not like Whitaker ever left his control. Yeah, if control had been broken, then then it would make sense that they would count that as a takedown. But I guess because control was there that entire time in that last. Uh, 10 seconds 10 seconds well yes but 60 seconds then i guess i just couldn't count the multiple times they picked him up put him down it was definitely a legendary fight yeah and speaking of legends yes how about that shogun hua versus lil nog yes that one was very very nice very very interesting um because I had never seen them in their original fight, their original fights um, in Pride or in, in the UFC. Um, but uh, I've got I've got the stats pulled up on screen uh, right now. Gosh, it's so close. Yes, it was actually very close. Now, I have heard people say that uh, Lil Nog here, uh, Antonio, uh, in a way I've heard, I, I, I don't know what they exactly meant by this. I, I can kind of understand what they meant, but not, not, not entirely. Um, that Antonio won the fight, but lost the decision. And Interesting. I, don't, I don't know if they mean that as literal as it sounds, because as we can clearly see here, Mauricio is the one that kind of came out on top and it was very close and I think when it comes to – I don't agree with the amount of significant strikes necessarily because it definitely seemed like in the fight the significant strikes that Lil Nog were, was landing uh, ended up being the more effective strikes. That's what I thought too. Um, but I think a lot of where the points come for Shogun was a lot of his kicks. Uh, you know, and, and again, it just kind of comes down to kicks and and how those can just get you those points. Plus, he did get those uh, those two takedowns, um, and of course, we all same, know. It's we all the know same. The I thought that the main event and the co-main had very similar styles to the fight. Yes, for sure. Like they both, the winners both have re heavily relied on takedowns and points and leg kicks, mm -hmm. which does win fights and it does slow down your opponent but i felt like little nog definitely hit way harder every time yeah for sure yeah it was just it was just interesting uh exactly how it uh went down um it almost kind of seemed like uh i don't know it was just it was just interesting it was just odd um because you wouldn't think um by the way that uh shogun had won that because it was split decision i'm i'm pretty sure it's been split decision all three fights if i'm not wrong um the main event it, was unanimous oh i meant like um oh their trilogy, their trilogy. Are, yeah 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 um because this is the third fight in a trilogy for those uh in attendance and new uh the uninitiated but yeah, it was just it was just interesting. You wouldn't, I don't know. It, I it, I don't know. I guess I guess I guess for me, a big part of what allowed Shogun to pull the victory out here was just these two takedowns. And it was even funny because I, I'll give credit back to those little Twitter things that I was bitching at earlier. Aljamain <laughs> Sterling tweeted uh, that Shogun broke the street rules of trilogies. And went for a takedown. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, credit really where credit's funny. due. See, it's good sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, it was just it was just interesting to me because 
I mean, it, it was just history being made. You know, the last fight on Fight Island and the last fight of Antonio Roguero, uh, Noguera. Just sad in a way. I mean, he's 44 years old. I guess it's like, it makes sense that he's finally, you know, retired and retiring. But yeah, it was just, it was just interesting. It was- I thought it was a beautiful moment. I'm sad that he lost on his last outing. It always it always puts a damper on you. It does. I mean, one of the things he- I was actually afraid of was if he won, would he would he have genuinely wanted to retire at that point? Because you know how winning can give people that. Oh man, I, I've got something left in me. You know, but, the whole Undertaker story over and over again. For sure, uh, but yeah, I I was I was a little worried of that. I'm not saying I'm happy he lost, but I th- I still think that he went out in a in a pretty in a pretty good fight in my opinion. He had a really good performance. I think he just he just went out you know the way uh, you know somebody just goes out. So and yeah, it just kind of makes me wonder uh, for Shogun. You know where's Shogun gonna go now? You know because. Uh, He's a legend, but I mean, like, how how much more does he have in him? You know, I and mean, he barely beat this guy now. Yeah. So. His, his, and in his his fight, his last fight, he won, but he got rocked very early on, and it was only the other guys. I forget his name, but he was on, he's on Izzy's training team or whatever. Okay, but, so he's like from New Zealand or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and. Gotcha. Uh, in his fight with Shogun, he rocked Shogun, but then he kind of rushed in and got caught. Okay. And then that led to the end of the fight being in Shogun's favor. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean... fight, but I think... I, if I've made this argument before. I think a lot... I think he could definitely keep fighting. I just don't know if he should be fighting for UFC top contendership. Is the answer always just Bellator? <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily Bellator over everything. It's yeah. just there's a, there is a lot of other competition and other promotions right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No. Yeah. Bellator. Um <laughs> did, you the, did you watch the Bellator fights on Friday? No. Because I don't have uh the whatever it is. The uh, design the d- or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I mean, I've thought about paying the hundred dollars for like a year's worth of service, which sounds really good. Um, yeah, I just don't know. Sergio, Sergio Pettis is over there winning right now. You know how it is; money's tight. So, yeah, I've wanted to. I've I'll wanted say, to. I'll, I've wanted to start watching Bellator. I'll buy it. I'll buy. I'll buy it for you, baby. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. Anyway. Moving on. And then Alexander guffs us into that arm bar, bro. Oh my god, what happened? I was so pull- I was so pulling for Alexander, it wasn't even funny. And I like, like we were texting. Yeah. We were with texting watching it and I was just like, Oh, he's gonna he's a Viking, he's gonna burn down a village or whatever. And then I was just like, Oh, he lost. Yeah, it happened really fast too. Yeah, um, and it was like right after Alexander put a combination together, and I was just like, "Ooh, his hands are fast. He's gonna do it." And the takedown. Yeah. See, it kind of looked like, um, not that he was out of range, but it kind of looked like he was just peppering him a little bit, you know, little little, little jabs to the face, little jab to the body. It gets you excited sometimes. Oh, it does because I mean, at first. Uh, one of the biggest things that I was I was asking, I was asking online and I was posing this question to you. One of the things that I was thinking was, is, is the quickness that Gustafson established for himself in light heavyweight going to carry over to heavyweight? And at first, I mean, like it really looked like that was the case, that he was actually, um, uh, he was light on his feet and, um, he was doing good, um, and you know, in a, in a at two hundred forty pounds, and in the division with all these other you know, uh, big guys, massive. yeah, massive guys. That that level of quickness, 
that, that could be a huge advantage, huge, huge, That's huge what advantage. What I was thinking. Um, and I and like I had said at the weigh-ins, he he looked fine. He looked filled out. Uh, he filled out fine. I didn't think that he was out of shape. I didn't think that anything uh, looked wrong with his performance going in. And even when the when the fight took off from the get go, and Fabricio went for that takedown, I felt that Gustafson uh, did a really good job of defending the takedown at first. But then it seemed like you know uh, they got on the ground. Verdum just did not let it go. He 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 was just so adamant about getting that takedown. He ran after Gustafson, tripped the leg, got him down, got his back. Gustafson is immediately fighting off a rear naked choke with all his heart, and then just without a second thought, Fabricio transitions into a. Um, Arm bar. Transitions perfectly into that arm bar. And then, you know, Gustafson is doing what he can. I mean, he was really doing good on his face, uh, you know, on his front, fighting off the arm, uh, doing what he could. But Verdum just likes to hug arms. Oh, my gosh. Once and, he's got one. Once he's I mean, got one, he's not letting it go. I mean, he, I mean the, the most Gustafson could have done at that point was fight the legs, you know, but it's hard to fight the legs and hold on to your arm because there have been times where we've seen arm bars uh, successfully completed uh, while someone's facing forward. It can be done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The face it's down difficult. Arm bars are thing. Yeah. It's difficult, but someone as skilled as Verdum can do it. And I knew, I knew, and I told you this before the fight that yeah. the one thing Gustafson has to get over when it comes to this fight is, <laughs> is, uh, Fabricio's uh, grappling because because I and, and last last time we had seen Fabricio he didn't look nearly as good in this fight versus his last fight against Olenek. Um, but he but I mean he he didn't look great in that fight he looked like crap actually. I thought but, he looked. That's why I was just like, "There's no way." Yeah. Yeah, but he looked like he actually lost a lot of weight and looked, yeah. or just looked more like sturdy. And that's because the last time we saw him, he weighed in at two sixty, and this time he weighed in at around the same weight as Gustafson, so around two forty. So he lost yeah. about twenty pounds. Yeah, he just looked better. Like I didn't really notice it at the weigh in. Yeah, but once I saw him in the cage and he was jumping around. I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit, he actually looks like you see the muscle like he showed up this time. Yeah. He was a lot sharper than than his last performance. And even in his last performance, I have to give him uh because this. He was very, very quick in his last performance. Fabricio Verdum is a very deceptively quick guy, and his grappling very game has so. always been on point. Always. I mean, he's the guy that uh tapped out uh you know uh Emilianenko. Yeah. And he's also, you know, I mean, he's just, he's just really, I mean, you know how I've felt about Fabricio in the past, but I have to give credit where credit's due. Yeah, he did great this, this time around. You he really pulled out a really good performance. Back a few videos ago. Oh, oh, of course. Are you kidding me? Ah, I just, I just dislike it when any person takes performance enhancing drugs of any kind um, to enhance their performance when we see what Fabricio, even at the level he's at right now, can still do and, and still perform. Exactly. And and one of the things, you know how you talked to me uh in the fight and you were you were asking me, is this gonna be Fabricio's last fight? And then we had oh we said no, we got it confused. It's Little Nog who's having his yeah. last fight. I had actually heard that Fabricio, he's on his according to him, he says that this is his last contract with the UFC. So, yeah, that is the one I read. Okay, yeah. So once this – I don't think it's this fight and then he's done. I think once he's done with this contract, however many fights yeah. he has left on this contract, and then he's done. Yeah. So, yeah, but he did great. Um, and when you and I were talking uh, about Gustafson. What does this mean for someone like Gustafson? I have no idea right now. 
it really is just perplexing to me because I was just I was just like, all right, so he's gonna he's gonna do something in this, and it was just over so fast. I was like, well, that's pretty off putting for your heavyweight debut. Yeah, I mean that was a. I'm not gonna say that that was a poor performance. I mean there was really nothing anybody could have done. Um, yeah. He did the best that he could with what he what he had, but if you put any damper on it, yeah, it, it it really puts a dark cloud over the whole idea because so, this was supposed to be a gimme fight in many in many people's eyes. That's what I thought. Yeah, but no. And, and so and, now, just with what we've seen, who do you put him against next in the heavyweight division? Gustafson. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Hold on. <laughs> You're going to look up the rankings? I have to. Yeah. I was going to say they put him against Olenek. I don't know. Because I, cause I mean, I, I put Olenek uh, above, uh, above uh, Verdum. Oh, yeah, of course. So let me see here. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe some somebody in the top fifteen. Yeah, you know, I probably maybe Walt Harris. That's that's actually an interesting one right there. Yeah, I mean Walt Harris definitely needs a comeback fight. Um, Alexander Gustafson needs a comeback fight. That's a big fight for both those guys. And uh, I think that would be perfect for either of them. I mean, I'm on, honestly, I'm making that fight more for Walt Harris than I am Gustafson at this point. But if you want two, two big guys to go up against each other, uh, that's probably the best fight I see for both those men. Um, or like I said, anybody within the 15s, the teens range, you know, not going into the top 10. I feel like I felt Walt Harris is probably the best bet just because he's right at number 10. Yeah. So... I thought that would be uh I thought that would be okay. Where does uh I mean geez, where does Verdum go now? Because now he's got options. Does he rematch Olenek? Does he fight any of these guys in the top fifteen? Let me show it to you real quick so you have it in front of you. He should go to Bellator. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice, nice. I try, I try. Yeah. I can the reason I haven't said any of these names because I don't want to do the injustice of mispronouncing any of these. Paulovich would be good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I mean Verdum I mean if this is his last contract, he can just do whatever he wants, in my opinion. Pretty much. Yeah. Everything short of fighting for a title, so you can fight the number two contender. You can fight. You can. He can honestly. You can put Verdum against anybody at this point. If this is is if this is his final contract, and then just call it a day. Bless you. Thank you. Let's just feed just feed him to Nganu. Yeah, Nganu's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking because I thought I saw. Rosenstrike somewhere. I he think just, here he I is. Think, yeah. I think they have something set up for Rosenstrike soon. Yeah, I it's think here. I saw Rosenstrike versus Dos Santos. It's the UFC two fifty two. So it's oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Um that that's that that's that fight, you know. T- tough nut for uh, Alexander Gustafson, but it happens to the best of us. You know, can't really hold it against him. Can't really hold it against anybody. But moving on, we've got your girl, the Cookie Monster, <laughs> versus the now defeated Marina Rodriguez. She was on an undefeated streak of ten fights, I believe. And, uh, I mean, hey, if your first loss is to the former champion, Carla Esparza, that's not bad. It's not bad. And she did a pretty great job, but I wouldn't have given it a split decision. Yeah, I didn't think it really deserved a split decision. Like I, like I said, the only reason that she got the split decision is because she put that egg on Carla Esparza's forehead. 
Yeah. And, and other that than it. that, other than that, she was pretty much defending. She was throwing some shots, but she was pretty much on the she's pretty much on the retreat. I mean, I think she definitely was piecing up Carlos Barza on the feet. Yeah. Um I mean it even says right here, significant strikes forty to a thirty three. But look at the takedowns. Five of nine. Right. And that kind of comes just down to the control. Not to mention, Carlos Barza was landing some really good ground and pound on Rodriguez pretty much the entire fight. And that does major damage. Yeah. And the only real issues that I had with uh, Carla's performance had to come from her submission attempts. You know what I mean. Those, those gosh diggity darn ankle locks. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot for a second. I was like, did she do this? But yeah, she definitely kind of stalled it out there. I mean, she, here's the thing. She, 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 In my opinion, she messed up with the first one because, well, one, she went into it too soon in the fight, in the round. Um, at around the three-minute mark, I believe she attempted it. For some reason, it only has one listed. I, I'm not even going to listen to any of this other in-depth stuff. I, I saw the fight, so I know how many submission <laughs> attempts she, she took. So I don't need you. Um, but basically, she she had her. She had Rodriguez. And then she immediately went backwards for the ankle lock. I swear to God, dude, she, she, must, she banged her fucking head on the cage. <laughs> she literally went, like, here's the, here's the cage. She goes, all right, I'm going to get the ankle lock. Bye. Bye. And Where then, are all these birds come from? Exactly. And then Rodriguez just sat up and started pounding her. Yeah. I mean, that was just it was a little embarrassing. You know, that just was just, that was, that was not being aware of her surroundings enough to realize I'm about to slam my, the back of my head into the cage. Um, and then she, I mean, like she just didn't have it at all. You know, I mean, she, no. she might've had it, but she left no room for herself to be able to extend. Yeah. Because I mean, like it probably wasn't her, her solid head banging, but I mean like the shoulders up, there was yeah. no room for her to, to go or to extend. And then going into the second round, I mean, she, she, I mean, again, she gets the takedown and she is dominating. She's dominating rodriguez rodriguez cannot do anything i mean rodriguez i'm not going to sit here and say that it was a complete blowout rodriguez is definitely trying to counter these takedowns she's trying to latch on throw carla esparza but esparza is just hooked she's glued and she and she gets these takedowns for sure i mean she's just she's a wrestler all throughout high school all throughout college she she's a former champion down yeah, I mean, she knows how to get the this these takedowns. She's an expert grappler, and so she's getting these takedowns, and she's on top for pretty much the entire round. And then with like, I don't know, like um a, a minute and a half left or something, what does she do? She get tries to takedown. she tries to get that submission again. Oh yeah, because for some reason she convinced herself. It would have, it, it would, yeah, it would have worked the first time, and so she goes for it in a more open space. She's more, you know, spatially aware of what's going on. But then what happens? But she doesn't get it. Doesn't, Rodriguez literally stands like right up and just starts pounding her. Yeah. And then the, the funniest part about the whole whole fight is in between the second and the third round. Her coach is like. Stop it. Stop you, it. You stop it right now. You are winning. You don't even understand how much you're winning, but you are winning by a lot, and you are putting yourself in jeopardy by doing this. You don't need to do this. And the commentators said it best. You know, Dan Hardy and Paul Felder and all those guys, we get it. You know, you want to make a statement. You don't want to be, you don't want to be like these guys that the UFC hates, like Jake Shields or, or somebody, where <coughs> all you do is wrestle. You yeah. want to get the finishes because people like finishes. People like to talk about finishes. People like to rewatch finishes. People don't like to rewatch fights where it's just you getting takedown after takedown and smothering your opponent. And Carla Esparza is a, a tiny woman. So her ground and pound mostly consists of smothering 
and trying to create enough space in order to ground and pound with most of the time missing or being out of range because Rodriguez actually has good uh, guard. You know, she has good, perfect posture, feet on the hips, everything. And it creates too much distance for Esparza. And it's understandable that you want those finishes, you want those submissions, but I mean, ankle, ankle locks are hard to get in the first place. Yeah. They're, they're very, very difficult. Position. Yeah. And, and it's not like she's coming from the, the, a place where it made sense. It's more like where she was already on her back. Carla Esparza is literally throwing herself all the way on her back from from a mounted position <laughs> she's body slamming herself stop it stop, <laughs> it. stop going for ankle locks oh it was so funny it was so crazy i mean like she gets the decision uh like i said i mean i i and really that those moments were like the only moments in the fight where i felt like rodriguez had an actual chance to come back and win but didn't because as far as I was just in control the entire time. Anyway, yeah. Great job, though. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, uh, the last two fights we've got on our list here, just wanted to go over those briefly. We've got Paul Craig versus Ant- Antigulov. Let me uh, pull it up real quick. This one was actually really nice. I texted you. This was like the first thing I, I texted you in the night because I watched the Alex Oliveira fight before this, and it wasn't that impressive but i saw yeah. this fight and this really like knocked my socks off um so antigulov paul craig i believe paul craig is swedish um antigulov i believe is uh dakistani um anyway this is really cool because you could tell right from the beginning that paul craig was just trying to really get under the skin of antigulov and get him to kind of uh rush in and 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 uh, immediately uh, go for takedowns or or something or another, um, and so Paul Craig kind of just like gets in his face, almost Coley Covington style. Immediately just crosses the ring, uh, octagon gets right in his face, and uh, pressuring him immediately. And the Gublov, you know, is just it, not taking that. Goes for and you know immediately starts pressuring Craig. I mean, just really wail on him gets this takedown and as he's going for this takedown uh you know craig is really you know know, jabbing him in the ribs you know pushing his buttons getting him uh more and more frustrated to continue the the onslaught continue uh really pressuring into him and uh antigulov doesn't even really realize it until it's too late that uh craig is setting setting up a pretty uh pretty nice uh triangle at first you know he was just climbing the legs up the body up to the shoulders and then it's like constant readjustment readjustment let me get it tighter let me get it tighter and then he's he's getting the arm he's pulling the arm through and he's got it and he's he, he tightens up pretty nicely and antigulov instead of fighting the lock you know focusing on trying to separate get away and get out of it he uh he's a uh, he's throwing uh, body shots you know he's focusing on punching he's focusing on ground and pound yeah, and it kind it <clears throat> it kind of made it tighter. Yes, because he's just it, he's he's not fighting the lock; he's fighting yeah. the man. Yeah, and I felt like all every time he extended to do the punches, he was just kind of sinking it in more and more. Yep, yep, and and that just and and the time Antigulov spent in the guard of of Craig, you know, trying to get these body shots. I mean, he, he landed some good shots. Don't get me wrong, but he's landing these good body shots and he's trying to get his good ground and pound. And, and Craig isn't really even flinching. He's not worried about that stuff. The entire time Antigulov is, is, is wasting, you know, his time uh, getting these punches in. Craig is just slowly but surely constantly readjusting and, and getting that triangle choke even tighter. And he gets it and he sinks it and Antigulov uh, has to tap. Uh, it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. Like you know, like I said, uh, it was it was impressive. It was beautiful. Uh, it's textbook level submission uh, techniques. You know, this is a submission uh, technician we got on our hands here, and and he came strong. You know, he really he really he really came in strong here, uh, and and got uh, got the uh, 
got the really honestly one of the coolest submissions and probably my favorite submission uh in in the in the uh mixed martial arts world <laughs> but yeah and then we have uh the fine the the, the opener Opening. slash finale uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh alex cowboy Oliveira versus peter sabata uh peter sabata i'm pretty sure i've never seen him fight before but i remember uh, hearing something about how he's only fought like three times in the last three years due to injuries, yeah, uh, something like that. And this was uh, luckily his fourth fight back uh, in the UFC, I believe, or with within however many uh, years. I gotta say, you know, Cowboy, he looked really good. He looked really solid in this fight. I think he was definitely in uh, control for most of the fight. Um, He's a jujitsu specialist, obviously. So any, so really, the amount of takedowns thrown uh, on Sabata's side, it kind of just seemed like you know because the striking just wasn't matching up. It wasn't doing anything for him on the feet. He had to go for the takedowns. But at the end of the day, uh, I mean, Oliveira is just a really hard guy to take down in the first place. Um, so I mean, it was just a standout performance. I thought that it was really nice. I thought it was really cool. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it, but I mean, it was just, it was just impressive. Oh, and I forgot there's actually one more fight right here. So I don't mean to completely brush over this, but I also felt like I have to cover this real quick. So this was, um, you, you remember this guy. Kam, Kamzat Kimaev. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this, this, I forgot about this completely after I had watched it for so long. Yeah. He outclassed to this guy oh he mauled him he absolutely mauled this guy yeah. look at this no strikes he didn't throw Nothing. a single punch he was hey, on the ground the entire time you want to hear something crazier yes so this is his second fight in the ufc in those two fights he's been hit twice i mean it's crazy and plus he is now the record holder for most victories in shortest amount of time yeah. 10 days 10 whole days. Amazing. The only way somebody could top that record is if they fought from one UFC event on a Saturday to the next Saturday. Yeah. That's the only way anybody could do it now. This guy set the bar really high. Yeah. Cowboy's like, uh, I can hold, I got another record in me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Most amount of losses between this week and this week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. I'm just cowboy. kidding. I'm just joking. Cowboy. You know I love Cowboy. You know I love Cowboy. I'm just messing oh, around. <laughs> but yeah, man, I felt so bad for this guy. I mean, he was a good sport about it afterwards. I got to give him credit for that. Of he, course. He, he didn't act like a douchebag or anything like that. I'm sure he's devastated by the loss and the uh, by the amount he lost by. Um, but I really feel like when it came to this, they just wanted to give this guy somebody to, to absolutely throttle, you know? Um, but this guy's great. You know, Kamayev is, uh, is super, super strong, super powerful. Uh, he's got, he's got all different kinds of tools. He's got the striking, he's got the grappling. I mean, he, any, any time, uh, McKee here, you know, rolled to get out from under him. I mean, Kamayev literally just grabbed him. Pulled him right back. Said, said nope. no. And just he wailed goes, on him. He goes, I'm a bear. Yeah. You the deer. Yeah. I mean, that was just that was just incredible. Uh, I like that a whole lot. Um shoot. Get out of here. But yeah, I thought that that was um pretty impressive. I also wanted to just briefly talk about this real quick because I had caught the tail end of the preliminaries. And I, I, just didn't wanted, up, I didn't. I didn't have time to watch it this this time. I was very upset. I'm probably gonna watch it later. Okay. I just wanted to briefly say something about it because I had just caught the main event of the preliminaries, uh, just because uh, Francisco Trinaldo was on there. Um, I've seen him before. I think he's pretty decent. Um, and then this guy, uh, Herbert Jai, Her Jai Herbert. Uh, I think this was his UFC debut. And he uh, he uh, main evented the uh, prelims. Um, as you can see, the fight was actually like really really even for the most part in terms of striking. Um, yes, uh, Trinago got these two takedowns, um, but Herbert was actually doing really well on the feet. He was actually doing so well that 
um, there was a chance it could go split decision to him, in my opinion. Yeah. Because the third round, he was actually doing really well in the third. But as you can see, within that third round, um, Trinaldo, you know, he swung big and he clocked the guy right off the forehead with this big oh, power no, shot. Oh, no, I did see that. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, and then he kind of just like – he had his hand up like this because I guess he thought, you know, it would come more towards his jaw, but it clocked him on the forehead. And he yeah. went down frozen like that. And when he went down, it was obvious he was – out cold yeah and herb took a second to stop it yeah and that was so weird because usually uh herb dean never does stuff like that that never happens i and think he was just confused on what had happened maybe maybe it was because i don't know that's just so weird to me though because how do you get confused when someone full-on falls on their back like that because because one of the it things was... i've always thought of I'm obviously I'm not a referee, but one of the things I've always thought of as a as a as a rule that I've held towards myself, if you fall in any capacity where you don't use your hands to try and catch yourself, you're out cold. Or or you're not conscious enough to have that motor function. Cause I think it's really easy to do when it's really easy to tell when someone falls forward. Because usually when people fall forward on their face, their hands are always coming up. But I feel like even when they fall backwards, if they're not using their hands to catch themselves, they're out. They're done. You need to call that fight. You need to stop it before anything else happens. But if I was going to give Herb Dean any kind of leeway, I would say that the thing that probably made it the most confusing was that when, when the guy fell, like I said, he was frozen like this. He had his hand up, so he's falling backwards, and I guess I guess when he fell and was down like that, it looked to Herb that he was still attempting to defend himself. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. I mean, that's that's the know. only kind of uh, leeway I can give, but I mean, it was pretty egregious, and it got to the point where even the announcers, like Paul Felder, is literally standing up, yelling into the octagon, "Stop the fight!" Yeah. Because the guy's out. And even Trinaldo was like, I don't want to hit him. And yeah. Herb Dean was like, the fight's not over. Finish him. <laughs> Finish it. <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh just gosh. like that one video. That one video that might have been like an old pride fight where he's just like, he's holding the guy's arm. He's just yeah. Kidding. Finish some some old like uh shooto brazilian nonsense or whatever i mean that was just that 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 was probably the most egregious I've ever seen. if if herb dean literally like grabbed the guy's defending arm and moved it to the side and said finish him <laughs> oh my god but yeah i mean luckily I, what's even weirder is that like i said this is the only fight of the prelims i've caught the announcers even said that this is like the second time tonight something like this has happened. And so it makes me curious, like what happened earlier in the night for them to I say, I was going to have to go back and watch it. They said this was the worst of the two. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if Herb, if Herb Dean was just off his, off his game or, or what, but usually he doesn't make bad calls like that. I don't know. So anyway, uh, I've got nothing left. I basically we got all the analysis out uh, here for us. Do uh, you have anything that you've got left going on? No, I, I think we've got pretty much all of it out. I had a good time watching it. A good time talking about it. Oh yeah. So I uh, believe. Let's see here before we leave. Let's just check something real quick. Nope, oh, that's not it. Okay, so it looks like this is next week. This is this next coming Saturday. The fights, like like I said earlier, they are not going to be held at Fight Island anymore, but this time they are actually moving back to the Apex Center in Las Vegas. So I guess Las Vegas uh, Commission finally got cleared or, or whatever for sporting events um, because now they're having it, like I said, at the uh, UFC's official Apex Center. And, and plus, you know, like we said uh, – before we were started recording Dana White's Tuesday night contender series is going to be starting up uh, next week at the apex center. So 
that's going to be really cool. You know, we got uh, Vincente Luque on the car. We got Jennifer Maya. We got uh, Derek Brunson and uh, Edmund Shabat Shabazan. Um, so yeah, it's it it should be fun. It should be it should be nice. Uh, it should be entertaining. Uh, and then the week after that, or maybe two weeks, because it says August fifteenth, and that's August first. Uh, so yeah, so it seems like two weeks after that is when we're gonna have UFC two fifty two, the long awaited uh, finale Try to the trilogy. Here. Yep, to Stipe Miocic and Daniel Cormier, possibly Daniel Cormier's final fight ever. So I can't wait. Yep. So that is basically all we've got for you guys uh, this week. Uh, stay in touch for any other possible videos we've got uh, going up on the channel between now and the next event. So see you guys later and uh, hope you have a good one. Have a good night.